Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. I'm actually very happy to say that I don't have my uh, brace on. Uh, I just got cleared today to wean off of the brace, so around the house I don't have to wear it. And by the end of this month, uh, I shouldn't have to have it at all. So I'm very excited about that. Today we're going to be talking about the M4 carbine. Uh, there's a significant amount of history that goes along to it. Uh, you look at the early days of the, uh, of the M16 carbines, which we're going to discuss during the Vietnam War. Uh, to the evolution of the uh, XM4, uh, to Colt's development of the M4 and M4A1 Colt carbines, which eventually would evolve into the U.S. government M4 and M4A1 carbines. Um, definitely want to talk about uh, the changes in the evolution, uh, which makes the M4 its own family of weapons, uh, which was really uh, it was really critical uh, in the decisions uh, of the U.S. government to not accept the M4 changes as part of the 1968 licensing agreement, which we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, we're going to follow that straight through the adoption of the M4, and then we're going to go into the uh, eventual SCAR program uh, and, and what led into that, and then into the uh, in the issues uh, in the early war, World War on terrorism, and then we'll talk a little bit about the uh, individual carbine and then where we stand today. The, the history of the uh, M4 carbine or the M16 carbine is very, very interesting. You, you wouldn't expect this kind of a story out of a small arm. You would expect it maybe out of a tank or a jet or something like that. Uh, it's got the drama of a soap opera uh, in a lot of ways as well. Um, but looking at where the M4 started and where it is now uh, was really sheer luck on Colt's part uh, because they never knew that the rifle was going to become mainstream. Um, its original intent was just to replace uh, the M2 carbine, uh, which guys carried who, or soldiers carried who needed more firepower than a pistol, but they couldn't carry a full length rifle. Uh, so, for support people, uh, originally is what it was developed for. They never had any idea that it was going to turn into the frontline infantry rifle. So, uh, without further ado, here, we'll start off in the Vietnam War. The earliest carbines were the, uh, the XM177, XM177 E2. Uh, you're looking at shorter 10 and a half, 11 inch barrels. Now, all those guns, if you notice, were XMs. XM means experimental. They were not officially adopted. There was no official TDP. Uh, in other words, they were COTS guns or commercial off the shelf guns. So the government would buy those. There was no military specification uh, for those. Uh, they, they were used. They were used heavily. Um, the Looking at the, the actual rifle itself, um, it was an M16A1 or a regular M16 with a telescopic buttstock, uh, two position aluminum stock. Um, the barrels were very short. They were around the 10 and a half, uh, 11 inch barrels. And they had found with those in Vietnam that there was an extreme amount of muzzle blast. And due to that extreme amount of muzzle blast, uh, they had what was called a moderator, which was uh, actually was part compensator, part, part sound suppressor. Uh, you actually had uh, baffles in the inside of the uh, the moderator that actually decreased the decibels of the suppressor or of the of the of the rifle. However, with extensive use, uh, they would eventually fill up with uh, carbon, and you'd have no sound suppression out out of it at all, and you'd have the full blast, which is considered a negative. Um, they had found when they had done the carbines that there were some major differences between the operating characteristics of the carbine versus the rifle. In particular was the shortening of the gas system uh, from the 20 inch barrel down to the uh, shorter barrel. You would have uh, basically only a carbine lamp gas system which was almost half the length uh, you had with a rifle. I did a couple things. First of all, it increased the rate of fire of the, of the, uh, of the weapon which was a significant issue especially early on in the Vietnam War uh, when these guns first appeared. Um, which could cause malfunctions. Uh, the carbines were, were considered less reliable than the, than the rifles uh, due to the higher rate of fire. Uh, you know, the overall system, you would have the actual chamber, you would have the, the gas port, then you actually would have the, uh, the plug. Well, your plug on your uh, the Goff 5s was a much shorter barrel, so you had to use a larger gas port to let more gas in to, to, to balance the system. Uh, so the barrels, they generally had the they had the single heat shield handguards, uh, which were uh, they, they were not very effective because when those barrels got hot, uh, you had hot gases coming out of the top and on the bottom that went straight on your hand. 
Uh, the, com the parts that were compatible with the standard rifle were the bolt carrier groups, uh, the components in the, uh, the lower receiver. Um, the only parts that really stood out uh, that were different were the stock, the uh, receiver extension buffer, uh, buffer spring, uh, the barrel assembly itself, uh, the handguard cap itself. Uh, this is actually uh, the M4 Delta ring, uh, the earlier gauze. Uh, you know, Carpies actually had the, uh, a straight uh, similar one of the M16A1s, XM16E1s, uh, but they were eventually uh, changed to the to the canted as well. Uh, this was all pre-1913 rail. It was all uh, pre-rail systems, um, and it was also pre-MA55 ball. So it was using the M193 cartridge. The uh, M the, the GAW fives uh, were continuing the Air Force, uh, the actual Air Force guns, right up through the beginning of the global war on terrorism. Uh, you'd be able to go into military bases, uh, Air Force bases throughout the country, and you would actually see in use those guns still. Uh, in fact, you'd also go to uh, bases and see really bastardized carbines. Uh, you would see GAW 5 uppers and lower you know, upper uh, or lower receivers with an M16A2 upper receiver with an M4 barrel on it uh, with a uh, M4 stock on it. Uh, a lot of these were actually not even properly assembled components. You would have M4 feed ramps on the barrel extension, but the upper receiver would not. It would be an M16A2. So you saw a lot of guys who actually uh, pieced together, uh, you know, you know, the carbines. Uh, the Air Force was the one who really had kept all those older carbines. Now you also did see what would be referred to as the M16A1 carbine. Uh, these were purchased a lot by Special Forces um, much later, probably towards the, the, the 70s and the 80s. Uh, which basically was a 14 and a half inch barrel and uh, a lot of people do ask where does a 14 and a half inch barrel come from uh, where that came from is during the uh, use of the gauze in the short commandos uh, the muzzle blast uh, when soldiers would go into uh, buildings uh, the muzzle blast was extremely uh, uh, loud uh, and actually punishing and at some point during testing they found that the shortest barrel they could go with that was acceptable for as far as decibels was the 14 and a half inch barrel. So it wasn't very scientific, uh, but that is actually where the 14 and a half inch barrel came from. Also it was a balance of reliability as well. Uh, by going with a 14 and a half inch barrel you had um, more dwell time uh, where the barrel was plugged uh, for the uh, system to operate. So unlike the shorter, the shorter barrel, you only have maybe an inch or so past the, past the uh, front sight base where the uh, bullet would actually work as a plug to have the gas system work. By having the 14 half inch barrel, you had significantly longer time where you had the barrel plugged so you could use less gas. So it was somewhat of a decrease in cycle rate. Um, it was sort of a reliability enhancement as well. It also permitted you to use a bayonet uh, on there as well. Um, didn't really add that much weight with the M16A1 carbine, but I also want to make sure you understand when you say M16A1 carbine, we're talking about Colt's definition of M16A1, not the U.S. government designation. The names of these rifles have always been also an interesting, uh, or misconceptions. Uh, first off was AR-15. What's the difference between an AR-15 and an M16? A lot of people would say, well, the AR-15 is Colt's commercial line and the M16 is the government line. That is totally incorrect. M16 uh, or M4 are U.S. government designations. Uh, they are the accepted weapons uh, as per technical data package. All of these rifles are AR-15s, uh, whether it's an M16A2 or A4 or an M4, they are all based on the AR-15 family. Um, for as far as the semi-automatics were concerned, Colt did utilize the AR-15 term uh, and under their trademark, which mostly uh, they used for their semi-automatic only line. But if we want to talk about, uh, you know, technically technical correct, the AR-15 is the actual uh, rifle itself. It's the stoner design uh, that was done by Armalite. And anytime you see an X in front of uh, any kind of a model number, like XM16E1 or XM177E2, those refer to as guns that are in the experimental stage. The XM16E1, for instance, eventually became the M16A1. Uh, those are all prior to... So looking at the original gauze, this video was actually on the M4, so we're going to go into the gauze uh, and the XM177s. Uh, those are earlier on in the, in the, the Vietnam War. Um, the Army was very quick uh, in the 80s uh, to get away from the, ga uh, the gauze, the XM177s, and go with the uh, M16A1 carbines for the Special Forces, Rangers, uh, SEALs. Uh, 
that comes around the 1985 with the adoption of the M16A2. Now, the M16A2 falls under what's called the 1968 licensing agreement. Now, the 1968 licensing agreement was where Colt uh, actually sold the rights to and gave the government the, t the authority and the rights to the M16 rifles. What that meant was the U.S. government owned it. Uh, they were able to uh, make modifications that Colt was responsible for. Uh, Colt would receive royalties uh, to it. And part of that was anything that was done with that rifle uh, once the 1968 licensing agreement was paid up was authorized and done by Colt. So when the M1682 was developed, that was a joint operation between the U.S. government and the Marine Corps. Uh, that fell into the 1968 licensing agreement because there was U.S. government money used to fund uh, the M16A2, the M16A4 programs. However, the M4 program was not funded by the U.S. government. That was actually funded by Colt. Uh, this is one of the things that separated the M4 family from the M16. Most people will look at the guys and say they're all the M16 family. Well, technically they're all uh, M16 family, I guess in my opinion I would, I would have to agree with that. However, uh, the M4 carbine uh, had a significant number of changes to it that was totally outside of the 1968 licensing agreement, which is where you get uh, M4 versus M16. Um, so starting back in 1985, you had the adoption of the M16A2 and the MA55 ball cartridge. There was a requirement set forth by the Marine Corps for a carbine. Uh, and, of course, that carbine had to uh, utilize the, uh, the new M855 ball ammunition. Uh, this initial uh, request did not last very long. It was it was defunded uh, and didn't go further. And Colt actually started moving forward with the development of a new carbine. Um, they looked at the M16A1 carbine and they saw the modifications that were made on the M16A2, and they could certainly pair them together uh, with several of the changes. For instance, the original XM4 carbine uh, basically was what we refer to as the M16A2 carbine. Uh, it had the M16A2 uh, carrying handle. Uh, it did have the extended feed ramps, which we're going to go over in a little bit. Um, it had the double heat shield hand guards, uh, which were utilized uh, to protect the shooter's hand. It utilized a 1 in 7 inch twist barrel with also the step cut uh, to allow the, adop the adaption of the M203 grenade launcher. The early rifles also uh, were fully automatic. Theater. There was no three shot burst. They utilized the second generation polymer. Uh, Climber stock. Uh, these guns were, were visually seen actually in, uh, I'm sure you may have seen the movie Black Hawk Down. Uh, what those guys were using were uh, XM4 carbines or M16A2 carbines. The term XM4 didn't come into play really until uh, the U.S. government started looking at it and started testing it. Um, oddly enough, the M16A2 carbine, uh, according, to, you know, according to Colt, uh, was was very similar to the uh, XM4. However, Colt had what they called the M4A1 also, which is different from the M4A1 government model. The M4A1 actually utilized the mill standard 1913 rail, which is something else that we're gonna discuss. So when you hear Colt's definition of M16A2, XM4, M4, M4A1, you need to be able to separate that from the actual US government uh, rifles. The M4, M4A1 were the finalized uh, TDP adopted rifles uh, you know, for the U.S. government. So first generation uh, M4 carbine, M16A2 carbine basically. Um, there were some of the changes made such as the feed ramps, uh, you did have the, the new hand guards, you did have the new barrel profile. Um, it was never finalized uh, for U.S. government use, it was a commercial off the shelf rifle. Now we're going to move forward to the XM4 program. Colt, uh, in, the, in, the, in the meantime, the government was on and off looking for uh, a replacement carbine. The government ended, what ended up doing, they wanted to look for a replacement for the M1 carbine, the fully automatic M2 carbine, the M3 grease gun, and M4 was the next in line. That's where the actual term M4 comes from, uh, is the next in line for a personal defense weapon. Again, as the rifle was conceived, it wasn't conceived as a frontline battle rifle. It was considered for the same purpose the M1 carbine or the M2 carbine were. Not a full-size battle rifle, but more firepower than, a, than an actual uh, pistol would give. 
we're going to talk about now is the M4 carbine, what changes were made to it, which actually got it outside of the, um, the U.S. government's uh, 1968 licensing agreement. The rifle that we're looking at here uh, is actually a Colt LE6920. Uh, the LA 6920 was introduced in 1998, uh, well after the adoption of the M4 carbine in 1995. It has all of the uh, enhancements of the U.S. government M4 carbine. Most of the parts are the exact same. Uh, the only major difference is the fire control group. Uh, this is a semi-automatic only, and also the barrel length. This is a 16-inch uh, barrel versus a 14 and a half inch barrel. Other than that, this gun is pretty much identical. We are actually going to start from the butt of the rifle, and we're going to move forward. First of all, we're looking at the stock. This is the actual U.S. government issue stock that's current. Uh, prior to the adoption of the, uh, the M4, uh, we had the original uh, M16A2 stock, which actually was actually polymer. It was a smooth polymer versus the aluminum stocks that were on the original uh, GAW rifles and XM177s. This would be considered the uh, third generation stock. If you look at the uh, first generation, it was actually an aluminum stock. Uh, that was that was put on the gauze and the XM177s. Then come time for the M16A2s, uh, they actually had the similar stock, but it was uh, made of polymer. Uh, it was all smooth. And you will actually find uh, M4 carbines that were delivered to the U.S. government with that. So this stock here was actually created uh, at Picatinny. Uh, is, a, is a much better, more durable stock, more uh, durable material. Uh, so this is what was is currently on the, uh, the M4 carbine that's being issued. Uh, Special Operations Forces, the Navy have adopted other types of stocks, such as the uh, LMT SOT mod stock. Uh, but the actual TDP rifles, where they're, uh, they're purchased and delivered to Aniston, is going to be the actual, uh, actual third-generation stock. The receiver extension itself, um, the biggest change that has had uh, since the M16A2 moving forward, the original uh, GAW rifles and XM177s utilized a two-position stock. So you had fully closed and fully out. The receiver extension itself was actually changed to include four, four positions. And the main reason for that was the use of body armor has, has massively increased. Uh, Vietnam era, you basically had flak jackets that were not really that thick compared to modern body armor. And what this did was it enabled you to be able to uh, adjust uh, to the thickness of the body armor that the individual soldier had so they could get a good cheek weld on here and be able to use their optics. Uh, was the actual purpose for that. Uh, the next change was the actual barrel nut itself. Most of the M16A2 uh, carbines and of course the early gauze and uh, M16A1 carbines utilized the original uh, receiver extension nut which was adjusted by a spanner wrench. You have basically a hole and you have a spanner wrench with a little tit hanging down that you would hook into the, uh, the receiver extension nut and you would rotate. Um, that was not a very effective way of doing it uh, because those little tits on the wrench would break right off. So uh, during the M4 development they reached a new design. The new design actually had four locking grooves where a wrench would get in there. It would be much easier to stake. During the development process a new buffer was, was created for the M4 as well. Uh, this actually worked uh, on the same issue that the M4 feed ramps did as well. Um, in the, in the end, you either needed one or the other, you didn't need both, uh, the extended feed ramps and the buffer, or we're going to explain uh, the whole concept behind this. But uh, I will tell you that um, the feeding issues that were caused by the actual M855 round, if we take a look at the actual M855 round versus the M193, looking at the two cartridges here, uh, we have the uh, M193 ball on, on the uh, side here, and this side here is the M855 ball. If you actually look at the shape of the, uh, of the projectile, you'll see that the overdrive on the M855 is much sharper uh, than that of the M193. The M193 and the, and the, and the gauze and the XM177 did not have any issue because of the shape uh, of the projectile uh, with it being presented into the chamber uh, along with the cyclic rate. They found with the uh, M855 ball and the carbines due to the higher rate of fire that the actual nose of the projectile could actually uh, get caught or, get or, or jam uh, striking the actual barrel extension itself or the receiver itself. They needed to slow down that closing stroke uh, to allow for uh, the cartridge to be able to fully uh, present itself uh, to go into the, uh, the chamber. The feeding issues were dealt with Colt in two different ways. First was with the development of a new buffer. This is referred to as the H2 buffer. And the H2 buffer has two steel weights and one tungsten. 
the actual tungsten weight is is one of these is the, is the same weight as two of these. What that did was it slowed down the uh, closing stroke on the on the on the buffer it's, on the bell carrier itself. What that did was it allowed enough time for the M855 round to fully present itself, so it would go straight into the chamber. The second way it was uh, it was approached was actually making an extended feed ramp, which uh, this cured the problem as well. Uh, so basically, the M4 carbine you'll actually will see these on all of the uh, the carbine receivers. You'll actually see an M4 uh, above the gas tube on the uh, on the upper receiver itself of a mil spec rifle that indicates that uh, it has M4 feed ramps. Well, oddly enough, you didn't have to have both of these. You didn't have to have both the buffer as well as the extended feed ramps. However, Colt kept both. Um, some would say that it was overkill. Others would say that it was just a way that Colt could show there's some additional work that they had done that was outside of the 1968 licensing agreement. You will notice that there are several manufacturers that, that may not use the extended feed ramps because it's not an issue with uh, as long as you have the H buffer and vice versa. If you were to have the H buffer, you wouldn't have to have the feed ramps. So you can see the rifles come both ways, but for as far as the actual military rifles are concerned, all M4 carbines will have extended feed ramps. It will be marked right in the front M4 to identify that upper receiver as an M4. And as they leave, all M4s with a standard a contour barrel will utilize the H buffer. Next thing we're going to talk about is the actual 1913 rail. This is something that many people like to argue about, but very few people can actually uh, document proof of where it came from. And I'm going to tell you from the proof that I've seen, which has been pretty substantial, of where it came from. Um, this was first available on the uh, on the M4 carbine uh, around the 1995 time period. Um, the quintessential M4, or the U.S. government M4s, every single one of them were delivered with uh, the flat top receiver. So we're going to delve into a little bit of the 1913 rail history. The first rifle to ever use a uh, rail that was actually integral to the receiver was actually done by Colt in the uh, in the 60s by uh, I believe that was Hank Tatro. Uh, there was a model of the uh, M16 that utilized a, it was not a, a rail of such, but it was uh, where there were notches in the uh, integral to the receiver where you're able to mount a scope. So for as far as the who actually invented the, up, the, the upper receiver that, that, would, that would accept a scope that was integral, that would be that would probably be Hank Tatro from, uh, from, uh, from Colt. The next thing is the actual rails itself. You know, who developed the actual rails? Oh, that'd be Weaver from the Weaver, Weaver uh, rails. Now, the problem with the Weaver rail was no two were the same. There was no standardization. And that became a problem every time you would uh, you get a new uh, optic or to put on it. I mean, you never knew what was going to happen for as far as uh, attachment because, again, they were always different. Now comes standardization. This is where Richard Swan, or, or Dick Swan, comes in from Arms Inc. He was the actual, uh, if you want to say, designer of the finalized 1913 rail. If you look at the finalized dimensions of the dovetails and the stop notches, the actual mill standard 1913 rail uh, dimensions, the standardization, which is what we know today as a mill standard 1913 rail, came from arms and came from Dick Swan. Uh, this information was corroborated in several ways. Uh, first off, uh, there was actually a drawing, a Colt drawing, that, uh, that had him, his signatures on it, with all of the dimensions that, were, that he had placed on it. Um, also, he had had documentation uh, from non-disclosure agreements. Now, believe it or not, the first military to actually issue flat top upper receivers was not the U.S., it was Canada with the C7A1 and the C8A1. Uh, it had an integral rail, but it was not the Mill Standard 1913. Uh, they actually had their own Weaver type rail that uh, Dick Swan was also responsible for prior to the 1913 rail. But uh, since the adoption of the Mill Standard 1913 rail, every rail that's gone on U.S. government equipment has adhered to those standards and those rail dimensions. And by having that made properly and the dovetails on the attachments made properly, you have a very solid uh, fit between, the, between the, uh, the mount and the actual rail itself. I also want to address something else. You will never hear me say Picatinny rail, because uh, as far as I am concerned and based on my research, it's totally false. Picatinny was actually the, uh, they were responsible for coordinating it, but they had nothing to do with the development of it. Uh, so the actual name is the Mill Standard 1913 rail. Uh, and that's what you will hear me refer to. Uh, I, I think that it's wrong to refer to it as a Picatinny rail because, again, they were not the originators. Uh, basically, what Picatinny did was they came up with the actual uh, requirement for uh, the rail interface, but uh, they were not the designers. Now, as the rifles were developed and then issued to the, to the military, they came in a couple different ways. 
First off, they had a detachable carrying handle. Now, the detachable carrying handle uh, had the same M16A2 uh, fully adjustable rear sight windage elevation. The difference was was the actual range. Due to the uh, the actual width of the or the, the length and depth and everything of the removable carrying handle, you did not have the length to boost it up to 800 meters uh, like you had with the uh, M16A2. You had a much shorter uh, uh, I call it a much shorter stem on there with a much finer uh, adjustments uh, that would actually fit into the carrying handle which gave you a uh, maximum range of 600 meters instead of 800. And as optics became more and more available uh, the carrying handles were basically discarded. Uh, sometimes they would put them on the bottom of the 1913 rails, other, other times they just throw them out completely and they would go with backup sights. Initial backup sights you saw a lot of them uh, designed by arms uh, in Knight's Armament. Um, this particular one was designed by the Air Force. Uh, this is the Matek backup site. This was the quintessential uh, backup site issued to uh, on the M16 uh, A4, M4, M4A1. You can tell it's Air Force too because it looks like a bomber site the way that it has the adjustments going up and down. And you also just engaged and disengaged. This had always had a problem with uh, these things breaking uh, and there was no way to hold it down. So, you know, the Montex site has had its fair share of uh, issues as far as durability and reliability is concerned. But you'll see many rifles also that don't even have uh, re you know, rear backup sights on them at all. They just have the optics on them. Next thing we're going to look at is the trigger mechanism itself. Now, the M16A2 uh, has the three-round burst mechanism. Now, the three-round burst mechanism was inflicted on the U.S. military by the Marine Corps in an attempt to have a mechanical gadget that would replace proper marksmanship training. Um, it has been an issue with everybody who's ever used it. Uh, it was directly contradictory to the whole point of having the AR-15 in Vietnam. The whole point of having the M16 in Vietnam was to have controllable fully automatic fire, which increased the firepower uh, exponentially on the individual level. By going with a three-shot burst mechanism, not only did you decrease that, uh, you, you decrease the amount of firepower that an individual could put out. It also created some mechanical issues as well, and the fact that the, uh, the burst mechanism did not reset. So we're going to go over, first of all, uh, the way that the burst mechanism works. Okay, shown here is, uh, this is actually a cutaway version that shows uh, the actual burst mechanism and how it actually functions and how it cycles through uh, its three-round burst cycle. Before we start with it, we want to make sure that we're set uh, we're set at, uh, at the start. So we're going to go forward four times. Okay. Now we're starting off with round one. If you notice, Nessie is engaged right at the edge of the large stop notch. First shot, we pull the trigger, fires. Now you'll watch the actual cam itself rotate. We're to the second stop, stop notch for round two. It's caught by the automatic sear. Bolt comes forward, trips the hammer again. We watch again. We'll see how it goes to the second stop notch, shell notch. It's engaged by the automatic sear again. Now we fire round three. Fires. Now it goes all the way back into the deep notch, where now both disconnectors will engage. And now it stops the actual cycle. So when the trigger is pulled, the bolt carrier goes forward, it's held. It's now ready for the next full burst cycle. The problem with this burst setting is, is it's not recyclable. So say you're interrupted right now, the bolt locks open to the rear because uh, uh, the magazine's empty. So you've now interrupted the burst cycle. So as the trigger is released, it remains in this condition here. You insert your next magazine, you're on burst, you, know, you would expect to have three rounds, you are not going to have three rounds. You're going to have what's remaining in that cycle so you're only going to have one one round so it does not recycle like the HK MP5 so again I think this was a, was a horrible design it's something that uh, I think was a, a mistake for the military to go with uh, but you know, it is what it is now what's specifically about the M4 if you notice we have two different uh, hammers here we have a black burst cam and we have a nickel plated one. This one here is for the M16A4. The M16A4 has a lower cycle rate uh, so you have these more these more shallow notches here 
that's all that's necessary for the uh, for it to function in a 20 inch barrel. The M4 again you have different dynamics you have a much higher rate of fire higher bolt velocities. When using the uh, standard rifle cam they found what they refer to as non-conforming burst or instead of it stopping on the stop notch you would get an extra shot uh, and you would have these these issues so what they did was the stop notches they made much deeper so when Nessie would engage that they would engage it much deeper and that prevented having non-conforming burst or four shots instead of uh, three so for the M4 there's a whole redesign of the actual burst cam itself and this is something that uh, any military armor should know is that you do have two different burst cams you can use the uh, the M4 burst cam and an M16A2 or an A4 without a problem, but you do not want to use a, a rifle a A2 or M16A4 burst cam in an M4. I also want to go over some of the back. We've seen how burst works. You actually can see how the second disconnector with Nessie on it actually works to stop the cycle during the three-shot burst. Well, what, is, what does Nessie do during fully auto, or during semi-automatic? Nessie is always engaged. Uh, whenever whenever uh, the hammer moves forward. The cam is always cycling. However, uh, the second disconnector, which you see right here, this is the one that actually cycles and uh, functions for semi-automatic only. Um, when you hit a select lever on semi, this is always forward. So regardless of what happens to the second one, catches, fires. As you can see, Nessie is cocked back once. So what that, what that means is if this thing was on burst and the automatic sear was doing the operations and the uh, second disconnector was disengaged, this would be round one on the burst cycle. So now go back again, release the trigger. I'm going to fire again. You can also see again how Nessie is uh, disengaged. Go again, release. Now I fire for the third shot. Now you can see how both disconnectors are, are simultaneously they're, they're side by side. That is the end of the burst mech, the burst cycle, which again is, is irrelevant to the uh, you know to the um, semi-automatic only because it's always engaged. Now there has always been controversy about this due to the actual disconnector. You have a you know, Nessie is always uh, under spring tension. Now the spring tension it's going to have when it's on a, on, a, on, a, on a short notch versus a deep notch is going to be different. In theory, you could have up to six different trigger pulls on here, just based off of the amount the uh, disconnector spring is uh, is depressed. You could have three, say that would be a heavier pull because you have more tension on the uh, disconnector spring, and then you fall into then it falls into this, and that takes pressure off of that spring, so you could have a lighter one. Now, even though the Marines uh, were the ones who wanted the rifle set up basically to be a match rifle uh, with the fully adjustable rear sights, adjustable for one inch and elevation. They chose those, those advanced sites, but they went with a mechanism that actually uh, hindered their trigger pull. Uh, and that was always a complaint with the M16A2 and with the burst mechanism was the trigger pull. And that converted over to the M16, uh, I'm sorry, converted over to the M4. Um, however, during the uh, recent issues with the M4 product improvement program uh, and with new production M4s being uh, produced, this is one of the things that they finally got rid of. The actual burst mechanism is no longer in production. There's been efforts to uh, replace the burst mechanisms on the M4s and M16s with uh, the standard safe semi fully automatic. The bolt carrier group of the M4 is identical to that of the M16A2 with one major difference. The extractor, and extra the extractor spring and extractor buffer. Um, due to the operating dynamics of the, M4, the, of the, of the carbine length gas system, the bolt is actually beginning to unlock sooner than you do on a 20 inch rifle, which that means is there is still residual pressure uh, in the cartridge case. So you're basically trying to pull the, trying to extract a round or a cartridge case that still has some pressure in there. That causes the extractor to work that much harder to uh, grip a hold of that rim to pull it out. What you see here is what's referred to as the gold spring. This has got an extra coil on it, uh, and it was designed specifically for the M4 carbine to increase extraction reliability as well as the black buffer that you see in there as well. Oddly enough, it took quite some time for the Colt to get the U.S. military to accept uh, this spring into the inventory. And it took even longer for them to adopt uh, this spring across the board so it could be used in an M16A2A4 rifle as well. This was a major reliability enhancement. Um, the extractor spring would be something that would come back to, I don't, I'm not going to say haunt the M4, uh, but it would come back to be uh, an issue 
uh, with SOCOM and with the higher cycle rates and the higher rate of fires and the more uh, gas port erosion. I want to talk a little bit about what gas port erosion is and how it relates to extraction. Okay, the gas port is drilled into the barrel and then the uh, front sight base goes over it. You basically have an alignment between uh, gas port on the barrel with the gas port in the uh, front sight base which goes into the gas tube. What gas port erosion is is flame cutting of the actual uh, gas port that's drilled inside of the, uh, the barrel. Inside of the barrel you'll see flame cutting which instead of seeing just a round uh, hole for the gas port you'll see a valley being cut in and it'll actually increase the diameter of that gas port. When that happens it allows more gas into the system. When it allows more gas into the system you're increasing your port pressure which means in turn you're increasing your cycle rate of fire. Now by speeding up that entire system you are still trying to, to remove a cartridge case that still has gas and still has pressure in it. The more gas that you, uh, you have in there, the sooner you're unlocking the bolt, the harder it is on the extractor. The SOCOM guys who actually fired uh, the M4 carbines on an extremely uh, high firing schedule, they would wear barrels out relatively quickly and they would actually uh, achieve uh, higher cycle rates because of this problem itself. There was one, uh, one of the fixes that was done to this was they actually put a rubber O-ring that went around the actual uh, extractor itself. You know, that rubber O-ring did is ex increase the extraction force by a factor of four. In fact, you could actually remove this ex the extractor extractor spring out of here and just insert the donut in there and it would work 100% reliable. But what that did was that gave a lot of uh, insurance per se uh, on keeping that uh, extractor from, from slipping off that rim. Gas port erosion is something that we're going to talk about um, further in the next video about uh, some issues that came up with, with SOCOM and uh, how some of the corrections were made and also how uh, SOCOM made some of their own changes to the rifle. Another change that was done on the M4 carbine was the actual front sight base itself. The M4 was the first uh, weapon to have the Milstein 1913 rail uh, flat top upper receiver. Well, when you actually put the detachable carrying handle on there, the rear sight actually sat up slightly higher than the standard M16A2 uh, rear sight would. So in order to make sure that your sight's properly aligned, you have what's referred to as the F-mark front sight base. The F-mark F -mark front sight base sits up slightly higher, which gives you the proper alignment uh, for your front and your rear sight. What can happen is, is if you were to have the wrong front sight base on here, when you would adjust your, uh, your actual front sight pole itself, you can actually be coming out of the uh, top of the receiver or top of the, the, the front sight base um, because it's it's too short and the government wanted to keep the exact same part for the front sight itself so in order to do that they had to move it upward now you will see a lot of companies who don't use the, the, the F mark front sight base what they do instead is they actually use a slightly longer uh, front sight post which, which does the same thing in fact Colt Canada or Dimaco uh, they did just that uh, they never adopted the, the F mark front sight base they adopted a, a, a longer uh, front sight post. This was another one of the things that was very unique to the M4. Now, when the M16A4 would come out uh, with the flat top upper receiver, this exact same front sight base was used for that. So basically, the rule of thumb was, if you have a front, if you have a, a flat top um, Milsinger 1913 uh, upper receiver, you're going to have an F marked uh, front sight base. Another change that was put in here as well was the addition of a uh, of a side swivel. Uh, this can be put on the right or left hand side. Uh, normally when you have the grenade launcher this is placed on the right side so this doesn't interfere with the grenade launcher. Um, as you can see it was uh, there's no sling swivel that's marked that's there. Uh, you see the bayonet lock and it utilizes the standard uh, A2 compensator. Shown in the front here is a standard 14 and a half inch M4 upper receiver. Um, these are the actual double heat shield hand guards uh, that originally came on Eventually that was replaced by the uh, Knight's Armament M4 RAS system, which you see on, on this rifle here. Um, however, you can see any number of different kinds of, uh, of handguards on these rifles, as well as, as well as backup sites. So you have probably 10 or 12 changes uh, that actually separate the M4 from the standard uh, M16A1 carbine or uh, any, of the, any of the gauze that came prior to it. So basically what that meant, this was its own family weapons, the M4. Well, when the government was looking at this rifle, uh, they had turned over uh, the drawings to, uh, to Crane, uh, to the government. Uh, they were looking to do some accessories for it. And without authorization, uh, the U.S. government, uh, or Department of Defense, or whoever you want to say, released that technical data to companies outside, which Colt owned that data. 
and that was illegal. Colt could have taken them to court and sued them. Well, Colt decided rather than suing them, uh, they were going to put together what they would call a sole source, or the M4 addendum. What that did was that guaranteed that Colt was going to have the sole source of the M4 carbine for X amount of years, uh, which uh, also included uh, full production rights. Then after it, could, it would come up for uh, renewal, uh, after, the, uh, after the sole source was over with, then it could go up for um, bidding, competitive bidding, but Colt would still get a royalty out of it up until uh, you know, a much later date. The actual... Uh, M4 addendum, uh, Soul Source was up a couple years ago, and that was the first time ever that uh, that Colt had to compete for the M4 carbine. They were the sole source. Now, when uh, this was done, Colt had no idea that the M4 was going to have the popularity that it did. At the time that they did this, this was still just a rifle that was designed for uh, corpsmen, for people in convoys, people who were mounted. Uh, it was designed for that same role as the M1 carbine. Um, that was for those guys, again, who had jobs, combat engineers, jobs they they needed more firepower than a pistol, but they couldn't carry a big rifle. Uh, this was also prior to the global war on terrorism, where the M4 would, tr would truly shine. Now, uh, there were some companies who were not too happy about the sole source. Uh, FN was one of them, because FN at that time uh, had the full contract for the M16A2 rifles. Uh, they had taken that from Colt due, due to Colt having some labor problems. Um, FN uh, won that contract. Obviously, FN wasn't happy that they were uh, they were out. They you know they couldn't bid on the rifle. So you have a combination of the gun being designed by Colt without government money, and all the changes that were made. Colt owned this rifle, even though the government had the drawings. They owned this rifle. Uh, they opted rather than to sue the government. They got the M4 addendum signed, and M4 production began. FN sued. The court upheld that uh, they had that uh, the U.S. government and Colt had the right to have a sole source, uh, based on uh, the circumstances that had happened, and FN basically had lost on that, lost on that, and Colt would go on to have the sole source for this rifle, up until a couple of years ago. Now, uh, due to them having that sole source, they also controlled the price as well. And if Uncle Sam wanted them, they were gonna they, they, would, they basically would pay whatever Colt wanted. And in the heyday, this rifle cost Colt, cost the U.S. government well over a thousand dollars, with you know as, as, as you see right here, uh, very very expensive. Now comes the global war on terrorism. Uh, U.S. troops start entering combat in Afghanistan and Iraq. The M4 carbine all of a sudden uh, becomes the, the front line weapon for special forces. They liked it because it was lighter, uh, it was more compact. And it ranges up to 300 yards. You really did not see any difference between the uh, accuracy of the M16A2 and the M4 carbine. And they started buying them uh, as frontline weapons. Well, when the rifle was designed, it was not designed with the same kind of durability and reliability that the M16A2 was. One of the mandates with the M4 was to have as many parts uh, interchangeable with the M16A2 as possible. And the Army actually felt uh, more strongly about having parts compatibility uh, between the different family of weapons than it did about uh, the reliability and making the M4 carbine the best it could be. So it wasn't too long before they were starting to find some issues that uh, there were very easy solutions for, but um, you know, early in those days trying to get uh, Ordnance Corps, not Ordnance Corps, but uh, Picatinny and the Rock Island to make these changes was, was quite difficult. Well, now the Army starts picking up this rifle, and they start ordering more and more of them. Uh, and next thing you know, all the ground elements, uh, for the most part, outside of the Marine Corps, were issuing M4 carbines in Afghanistan and Iraq. It was solely used by uh, Special Forces. Uh, the A2 carbines were gone, the old M16A1 carbines were gone, the Gauze were gone, any, any of those guns. And those guys did not use uh, you know, the 9mm submachine guns very often. They liked the M4. The only problem was the M4 was not necessarily uh, what they were looking for for as far as durability and reliability. And that was not the fault of the carbine itself. It was the fault that SOCOM actually wanted the rifle to do things it was not designed for. And we're going to lead this into a part two uh, coming up. Where we're going to go over the uh, issues that SOCOM initially had had with the M4 carbine, uh, how, it was, uh, how it was eventually corrected, but also leading into the SCAR program. Uh, and what happened with the M4. And also we're gonna start leading into as the global war on terror went 
more uh, went further, now all of a sudden we have an issue with uh, reliability and uh, some sort some company said they can make a better rifle uh, hence the HKM 4 HK 416 and the very vicious uh, campaign that went on to try to oust the M4 from the US military and replace it with uh, the HK 416 which will lead into the individual carbine uh, so I hope you enjoyed part one of this video uh, if you did please click like and please subscribe thank you